The last few weeks, uh, we've been looking into a study of what will be 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, but, but not so much every single verse, but on the subject of spiritual gifts, which is, is something that gets a, a, a lot of confusion, right? Uh, there are people that uh, make claims about what that means that aren't true. There are people that look upon it maybe with the wrong attitude. And uh, we wanted to try to dispel some of the myths, and we wanted to make sure that when we approach this very sacred subject that we do so in the right attitude. So the first week we actually looked at chapter 13. And we know that as the love chapter. We hear it a lot at weddings. And it might be okay at weddings, but really it's not about that kind of love. It's about love for one another as we work together using the gifts that God has given us in the church. Uh, 12, 13, and 14 of 1 Corinthians is primarily about what goes on when we meet together. Now, granted, this whole sitting in a room with pews looking one way, that's something we came up with. But that's okay. It's, it's a way that we manage to do it. We can't worship worship, right? We've covered that as well, and we will cover that some more. However, when we meet together, when we worship together, when we study the Word together, when we experience uh, the supernatural together, we have to have the right motives, the right heart, and the right attitude. So we started off with, it's all about love. It's all about love. It's love for one another, and it's love for those who are in the world who are lost. And then the, the next week, we said, we talked about the way of the Spirit, the way the Spirit works. The Spirit works differently than our flesh does, and a lot of times there's, people just can't seem to get beyond that. What we can't see with our physical eyes is often more real than what we can see with our physical eyes. And at the same time, we have to recognize that there are a lot of spirits that have gone out into the world, and not all of them are holy. So we have to test the spirits to see if they're of God. But the Holy Spirit, we talked about some of the, the character uh, traits of the Holy Spirit. When, when you sense that tugging, that, that pulling to just go deeper, that's the Holy Spirit. When you sense a, a gentle conviction of something in your life that God wants you to surrender to Him, there's a, a loving uh, attitude toward that. There's a big difference between the leading of the Holy Spirit and the accusation of our enemy. Our enemy will accuse you and say, who do you think you are? Don't you remember what you did back then? And if that back then has been taken care of by the blood of Jesus, the Holy Spirit's never going to accuse you of something that's under the blood of Jesus. So we have to recognize, too, if it's that, that you're worthless and you'll never amount to anything, that is not coming from your Holy Spirit. That does not match His character and nature. So when we understand the way of the Spirit, we get used to the way that the Holy Spirit does what He does. He does so without, uh, without rank. He does so without uh, like singling out a favorite. When God uses us in spiritual things, we're not better than someone who's used in a different way. Amen. Right? Uh, a lot of the problem that the Corinthians had is that they were being used in the manifestation gifts of the Holy Spirit. We call them manifestation gifts because they, they translate into the physical. What we heard this morning, a message in tongues, interpretation of tongues. Two of the manifestation gifts, because they manifest before us, our physical senses recognize that something is going on. They're not necessarily resident gifts. We can't say that, that a person who is used in those uh, is someone who says, I have this gift. Well, they don't have that gift. They're being used in the gift. And they may never be used in it again, but yet again they might, right? We don't possess these things. We are privileged to be able to be used in them. So we approach them very prayerfully. And we approach it very cautiously. But yet, we don't have to live in fear that somehow we're going to mess something up either. That keeps people back sometimes from stepping forward in faith and allowing God to use them. So today, I want to talk about something else in this. And that is, in case you didn't know it, 
people are different. <laughs> Have you noticed that? People are different. We're all a little different. You know, have you ever thought, said about somebody, yeah, he, uh, he looks at life a little differently. Yeah. <laughs> well, he probably thinks you're weird too. Yeah. <laughs> right? So, different isn't necessarily wrong. It's just different. Now, that, of course, is within biblical confines, right? Um, our, our world today says that don't judge me, I'm just being different. Well, there are some things God's already judged. So we don't judge, but He already has. And so there, there, there are biblical parameters to this. But we can really get caught up in things that aren't written in here, but that we've done in here for a long time. And when someone does it different, ooh, that's weird. Well, maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe we get so accustomed to the way we do things and the way we do church. I guarantee you, I've been to thousands of churches, there are more church splits and fights over stuff that isn't in here than there are about things that are in here. Everybody knows you don't do that in church. Everybody knows you do Where? Tell me. Come on. Help me out. It's not there. But we hold that personal religion very closely. You know, sometimes it's the length of the service or the type of the songs or whatever it may be. And you'll have camps that are just, just absolutely committed. It's got to be in here. The order of service, right? That's why we don't do everything, anything ever the same way week after week because I refuse to get into a rut. So, different isn't necessarily wrong. It's just different. And within the confines of biblical truth, Difference should be celebrated. Amen. Difference should be, we should get excited about the fact that we're all different. I mean, you know, take a look around. We're all different. We look different. There are different things that, that, that float our boats. There are different things that we get passionate about. There, there are different ways that we put ministry, put feet and hands onto ministry. And we should celebrate that. In our day and age, if, if we do not get creative and really get to the heart of, I want to lead people to Jesus, if that is not the core of why we exist, we will die. Amen. Right. Going to be a lot of empty buildings, folks, that have steeples on them because they cannot get past the way they do things. But if your focus is not on bringing people to Jesus and growing disciples, yeah, shut the door. Yep. Amen. So, to get creative to meet people where they are, we don't change the gospel. We don't change the truth of the word. But if we're not constantly looking for ways to get creative, and guess what? God is creative. He spoke everything into existence. Creator God, if we're created in His image, one of the characteristics that He has implanted within us, one of the seeds that are inside of all of us is creativity. The, the gifts of the Holy Spirit that we look at and we will eventually get to in this study are, are creative. They're different. They, 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 are, they are given to and allowed to People are allowed to work in them and through them in ways that are definitely creative, beyond anything they ever thought they had. So, we talked a lot about some volunteers this morning. We got volunteers for BLAST. We need volunteers for the tent meeting. We need volunteers for uh, Royal Rangers. That, that's not just to keep you busy, and we don't want to wear anybody out, but different strokes for different folks. Some of you are going to be called to one thing and not to the other. The idea is that we're all working together. And sometimes you have to just say, you know what, there's something in me that is saying, you know what, I think God's asking me to do that, but nowhere, no way in my mind can I imagine myself doing it. Well, maybe He wants to work through you. And He wants to stretch you. And He wants to make you uncomfortable, not because He doesn't like you, but because he wants to grow you. Amen. Yeah. Take some risk. Take some risk in your life. It's worth it. You know? 
we can get really comfortable. I mean, I'm glad we have air conditioning in here and nice, comfortable, bright orange pews. <laughs> and, and I'm glad we have a sound system and I'm glad we do streaming and all of those nice things that make it convenient for people who can be here and people who can't. But uh, you know what? If it means that we never take any risk and never trust God to do something beyond our natural talents and abilities, well, then let's go back to benches and no air. Okay, maybe not. But anyway, uh, <laughs> when God created, he did not make one animal, one plant, one tree. He did not make one gender. He made two. Amen. Only two, but he yeah. made two. Amen. But listen, listen, don't, don't let that get you. We got to love people who are, who are confused. So I don't say that to to be harsh against anyone, but there's two, male and female. And without that, whether it's animal life or plant life, nothing would continue to exist. God created everything to bear seed. He didn't wake up today and have to start all over. He set it in process back at creation. And he does the same with us when it comes to spiritual things, and especially spiritual things in church which is actually what I entitled this series, though I don't think I ever told you that. It's like for my own whatever, I just needed to have a title, Spiritual Things in Church, because there are spiritual things that happen in church. Not all of them are of the Holy Spirit, (laughs) but we want to focus on the ones that are and pray that God reveals to us where we get in our own human spirit, right, Or, or where we let uh, maybe one of the spirits in the world affect our decisions. So this is what this whole thing is about, what we do primarily in the church. You know, uh, marketing takes things that are different and elevates them for disingenuous reasons to make a buck. We're here to celebrate differences in their truest, purest sense, that God made Terry different than he made me, and he made Tom and Kathy and everyone different than he did me, and this person different than you, and we should celebrate those differences, and we should look at what God has been using these people in and say, man, that's incredible. We should be encouraging. We could say say to my dear wife, Melody, who has had 30-some years of teaching kids and she ends up helping with Kids Church too, that ain't me. Kids, I'm lucky our own survived. (laughs) I've never felt called to kids ministry. It's not my strength or gift, it's hers. I celebrate that. I'm not jealous of that. I celebrate that. That's the way we should be in the church. Celebrate one another. Amen. So there are different tools for different purposes. I don't know if any of you, I I don't really know if I've told anybody here. Does anybody here know what kind of trade school I went to right after high school? (laughs) Jared, you'll get a kick out of this. I went to auto body and I worked in a body shop and there were tools. These are almost antiques now, which really makes me feel bad. So, They're both hammers, right? They're both body hammers, but they're different for different things. You can see which one I use the most because it's all wrapped with tape. And one of the first things they told us is you never use a hammer from the back. You use a dolly from the back and you tap on the front, right? There's a couple different types of dollies. I only brought two for different purposes. They're all tools. They're both dollies. Those are both hammers. But they're different. And you know what? God thinks of us a lot more highly than he thinks of hammers and dollies. But he is still going to equip us for the work that he's called us to do. We're not on our own to come up with the tools. He's going to, yeah, thank goodness is right. He's going to equip us with what he wants to do. And since each of us here are more important to God than just the tools he uses in, we also have to realize that in the hands of a master craftsman, wow, something beautiful can come. 
You ever see somebody that took a ball peen hammer and tried to pound out the dent in their fender? Looks pretty rough. But when a master craftsman, now they do paintless repair. They have so many techniques, different kinds of glue, and they'll a lot of times be able to fix your car without even grinding the paint off. 1 Corinthians 12, we're at today, verses 4 through 6. Now, last week we did 1 through 3. I'm really not going to do every single verse through the series, but these are introductory verses, so they carry a lot of weight. And a lot of times uh, we'll read the beginning of one of the epistles, and we'll see in the introductions, and we're tempted to to skip past the introductions, but a lot of times there's so much meat in the introductions. So obviously when Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthians, he did not write it in chapter and verse, but many years later, uh, the people that did separate this into chapter and verse uh, tried to find out where there was a, kind of a maybe a, not, not so much a new thought, but a different thought. So that's why it's important to look at the beginning of the chapters a lot of times to kind of get some frame of reference. We did that last week with verses 1 to 3, and uh, used the, the ESV last week, I believe, and this week I'm using the, the New Living Translation. And uh, this whole chapter is about manifestation gifts, and I already told you why we call it that, because these are gifts that, that manifest, uh, the Holy Spirit manifests through us. Uh, a lot of times they're momentary, not necessarily resident. Uh, we've got some other lists in Romans 12 and Ephesians 4. Uh, some of them are more resident gifts, especially the Ephesians 4, gifts to the church, right? The pastor, the teacher, the evangelist, the prophet, and the apostle. And, of course, there's differences of opinion as to what degree those are in use today. I believe all five of them are, but we have to be careful how we define them. Maybe that's another series for another day. But those uh, gifts to the church in the forms of people they generally seem to possess or at least be used in those gifts on a regular basis. But these manifestation gifts are a little different. And as I pointed out before, the, the believers, the young believers in the church in Corinth, this, this was not written to defend the use of these gifts. Not at all. We look at it as a list. Well, these nine gifts, these are the nine manifestation gifts of the Holy Spirit. Well, who says there's not 10 or 11? And it's not really to prove their existence, although we have used it that way, especially as Pentecostals. But, but when Paul was writing it, he wasn't writing to prove their existence. He was saying, when this happens, here's how you should do it. They had a problem. They were immature. They, they were coming out of a lot of them out of paganism. And they, they've been set free. They were truly born again. And the Holy Spirit was at work in them. But yet they had some problems with morality that they had not yet learned. So it wasn't corrective in, in that they were saying there is no such thing as these manifestation gifts, not at all. They were being used in them, but they, their lives weren't matching up. And sometimes the way they were using them or being used in them, they, they added flesh to it, and it created all kinds of problems in the church. So they were immature. It also is hope for us, if you think that you're not quite spiritual enough to be used in this way, here's proof that you are. If you're born again, if you've been changed, right, if you're a new creation, then you're eligible for God to use you if you're willing. That doesn't mean live any way you want. I mean, we teach holiness as well. That, and this is what Paul was teaching them in so many cases. Get your heart right. That's why I've taken so much time before we even get to these gifts to cover this. So we have the right attitude when we approach them. So let's look at this here. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 6. Uh, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. Same the same, but different. When he says different spiritual gifts here, the, the, here the term spiritual gifts is charisma. We think of someone who's charismatic or a charismatic movement or a charismatic church where you expect to see the gifts. 
and we think of charismata as the supernatural gifts, but really what it means is grace. Grace. And I want this to sink in for a little bit. Anything that God puts into our life, any blessing that He gives us, whether that be spiritual or physical or financial or relational, anything He gives us is by grace. Any, any manifestation gift that he chooses to use us in is all by grace. Can we just take a minute and let that sink in that you haven't earned anything. I haven't earned anything. Without the grace of God, we get what we deserve, and that's an eternity in hell. It's all by grace. So, when we think about grace. As a matter of fact, Romans 12, that word charisma is used in those gifts, and, and uh, we call them grace gifts, grace gifts. Well, in this case, when, when Paul starts out writing, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant about these uh, spiritual gifts, is the way our English translated. Really, it's a pneumaticos, the uh, spirituals. I don't want you to be ignorant about spiritual things. But now, in verse 4, he definitely says charisma, spiritual gifts, grace gifts. And I think in a church setting, and, and I know it's hard for you to believe, but people fight in church sometimes. And we have very little of that here. Praise God. Amen. It's a good place to be. I'm telling you what, God is doing something amazing here. But there's disagreements, and sometimes we fight, and sometimes our ego gets deflated. And sometimes we get offended, and we got to work through that. But when in, in all things, if we remember that anything we have is a gift, Amen. anything that we have is the grace of God, Amen. that we are saved by grace through faith, <clears throat> not of works, lest any should boast. Amen. We have nothing to boast about except we boast about Jesus. And I think if we understand that this is all by grace, it will save, it will save a whole lot of grief. It will save a whole lot of battles. Uh, it will save a whole lot of, well, they said this and they did that and, and all the stuff that happens in church sometimes. It saves a lot of it when we realize that none of us, none of us are worthy of it. But yet, in God's eyes, we are. We say sometimes, oh, it's not about me. It's all about Jesus. Meanwhile, Jesus says, no, it's all about you. I gave my life for you. Yeah. We are valuable to God, or he would not have gone to the lengths that he went to. Unmerited favor is a good definition of grace, right? Nothing that we did to earn this. And he says, while there are different kinds of grace, it's the same spirit that's the source. We can identify right off the bat that the Holy Spirit is going to give holy things for a holy purpose. The, 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 the spirit of this world or our fleshly spirit or a demonic spirit is not going to give you spiritual gifts. Amen. There are some people who look at 1 Corinthians 12 and they'll say, well, that's why we shouldn't even bother looking at these gifts, because look how immature these Corinthians were. They had one guy living in sin with his stepmother, you know, and Paul basically said, what, are you stupid? <laughs> right? Fix this. But they'll look at that and say, see, see, they weren't, they weren't even, they weren't even following Jesus, so we shouldn't even do this. No, it misses the whole point. It, it, what it says is that a, a, a reborn spirit is the qualification for God to give you gifts. And just because some people here and people throughout history have misused it or come into it with the wrong attitude doesn't mean we should not seek the deeper things of God. Amen. Different types of service. I love that. Service. We think about what we may want to call the practical gifts of the Spirit. A gift of administration, a gift of teaching, right? Uh, prophecy, these kind of things that, that 
seem to be resident in some people. That's a kind of a tangible way we can say, well, that's a, that's a serving gift. We can see that. But he's saying there are different kinds of service. There are different kinds of gifts that are used to serve other people. But the same Lord that gives them. God works in different ways. Boy, that's a Boy, that'll, that'll get the critical spirit going real fast. We have, uh, we have a guest evangelist coming in two weeks who's a little more excitable than I am. And he jumps and he, he really, and, but I see fruit in that guy's ministry. But the critical spirit says, well, that isn't right. That doesn't, I don't understand that. So because I don't understand it, I'm going to say it's wrong. God works in different ways. But it's the same God who does the work in, what's the next word? All. All of us. Us meaning believers in Jesus Christ. God works in different ways. Stop putting him in a box. The fear that you have, if you hear somebody say, don't put God in a box, is you know what some people in the world will say? They'll attribute all kinds of demonic stuff to God. And you say, well, I don't want to do that. Well, I don't want you to do that either. But I don't want you to put him in your religious box either. The more you know this, the less you create boxes. The, the more you read and study and ask the Holy Spirit to explain His Word, the less your critical spirit rises up. When you see something a little different, be on guard for things that are not biblical, but don't let that critical spirit come up and condemn something that God is doing only because He's doing it a little differently than you would. A critical spirit is one of the greatest devices of our enemy in the local church. Before you criticize, think, what am I criticizing? Do I know all the facts? If not, I'm being judgmental. Is this a preference of mine? Well, if so, it's fine to have preferences, but you don't have a right to criticize. If we spent as much time on discerning the spirits as we do on giving heed to a critical spirit, the church is a, as a broad term, the church, the church, would be in a much better condition. I like it when he says there's different types of uh, service. I believe it's the uh, NAS, at least, that's one that says different types of ministries. Diakonos, we get the word deacon, serve, one who serves. Uh, we have deacon boards in churches. They're there to serve. A pastor is there to serve. Uh, people who are greeting people at the door are there to serve. There are different types of service, but the same Lord. Do you see also how he phrased this? He, he gave uh, mention, equal mention to all three parts of the Godhead. He said there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit, pneuma, meaning the Holy Spirit, is the source of them all. So if we are seeking to be used by God in spiritual things, we need to not necessarily seek those particular gifts, but seek the Holy Spirit who gives them. Then he says there are different types of service, but we serve the same Lord, kurios. We refer to Jesus as Lord. Christ came to serve, didn't he? God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all represented in this short passage of Scripture. He does it all. Variety of effects, the, the New American Standard says, for different ways. A variety of effect. The same God who does the work 
in all of us. And that means all of us. I don't care what translation you look at, it means all of us. It means every believer in Jesus Christ is a candidate for the supernatural to happen in and through their lives. Not for their own credit, not for their own glory, not for trophies we put on a shelf, but for the honor and glory of God and for the benefit of other people, both in the church and out of the church. I don't understand how all this works, and I've been following Jesus for a long time. I've been be preaching about Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the gifts for a long time, and I still don't understand it. There are some things that happen, and it's almost like, where, where, where is this coming from? That's, I didn't expect that to come from. God is in His heaven. He does as He pleases. Amen. It removes the human element to the point of trying to remove that ego, but yet the physical is important. So on one hand, we're saying we, we, we want our flesh to die, and we die to self, but on the other hand, we have to be alive in the Spirit. Dream big and then dream bigger. It's one of our core values. Dream big for the glory of God. Dream big for the kingdom of God. If we dream dreams for the kingdom of God as a whole, God will certainly take care of our little corner of it. Dream big dreams. Trust God. So how do we put this into practice? Well, a couple of things. I came up with four. I'm sure there's more. Keep yourself open to different approaches to ministry. You know, we, we have groups that get together, whether it's a board meeting or, or different groups within the church and uh, events team and all of those great teams that work together. And a lot of times, you know, it's like brainstorming sessions. We sit around and say, what if this or what if that? And what if this? And, and, and those are good. And we remain open to different approaches. There is not one approach to ministry that is more sacred or solemn than another. It's, it's the gospel going forth is what is important. And if you know the Word of God, if you know the Word of God better than you do your traditions, that'll get you in a good spot to be open to different approaches to ministry. When we have met, we've done it twice now, we're going to do it again in September, where we have churches that actually leave their building on Sunday morning and go to a park and worship together. Do you realize what message that sends to a community that is convinced that all they're about is their own thing and all they're about is their money? We don't even take an offering. I mean, you guys know how to give, right? You don't need a plate put in front of you. We have boxes. We encourage you to give. We need all we can get to do what God's asking us to do, right? Amen. But we, we've all survived. We, we, we get out in public. We have a couple people who started coming to our church because they saw what we were doing, all of us, not just us, in a public setting like that. So why not? There was one pastor who, uh, in, in town, I won't see who it was, he said, that's a bit far from my people. They're not there yet. Because you're more in love with your tradition and your building. And sometimes that's where you're at. And that's okay. But let God bring you from that point. To understand what, what is the ultimate purpose of the church. And that is to make disciples, right? Sometimes it's a foreign concept. Sometimes it's out of the box. Maybe we need to have a campfire and burn the box. And it sounds good, but we all have our boxes, and we'll create new ones. Yeah. So maybe the best thing to do is understand that we all have kind of our little traditions, and, and that's okay, as long as they don't become the driving force of everything that we do. We can't rely on the tools of the past. I do not use body hammers anymore, but at one point, I did. I don't paint cars anymore, praise God, but at one time, I did. A lot of things I've learned how to do, and some of them I learned how to do to support my ministry habit over the years. God will, though, give you new gifts for a new paradigm, for a new season in life. You know, saying yes is the most important thing. Amen. He will equip those who He is calling. Amen. And don't be guilty of worshiping worship. Let's not get stuck. Yeah. Let's not get stuck. 
Here's the second thing we can do. Celebrate and appreciate the differences in one another. Value one another. Speak into one another. You know, the way that you, Bill, I never heard you sing any better. The heart you put behind that song. And I'm not saying that just to say that. Yeah. Encourage one another. I'm so excited to see how God used you in that. Randy reads minds. He knows what has to be done before anyone tells him. I mean, there are just people that have that ability. Chad came up and gave me a word before service, which is exactly where I was. And he knew it. Why? Is it because he's so smart? No, it's because he allows the Holy Spirit to work through him. So we celebrate our differences, right? I learned a long time ago that I'm, the last time I sang a tenor note was I was eight years old. It ain't going to happen. But I've sung all my life and I've adjusted. So we celebrate our differences. <laughs> Esteem others higher than yourselves. It's a good practice. That's also Pauline, Philippians 2, 3, when he says, here's what you should do in the church. Consider other people more than you consider yourself. Amen. Go ahead and be willing to take a back seat to somebody else. Because if you do that, don't worry, you'll be covered. Huh? You'll be covered. Resist the urge to criticize what you don't understand. Resist the urge to criticize what you don't understand. Oh, social media. Every time something happens, there's all the detractors. Everybody is the expert, armchair quarterbacks. Uh, one of the negatives of social media, there are positives, but one of the negatives, everybody is so critical. Resist that urge to have a critical spirit of things that you don't understand. I saw a meme the other day that said, as Christians, we can't make a difference unless we are different. Amen. We, we need to be different than the world, Amen. right? That speaks to sanctification, and, and, and a life set apart from the world doesn't mean we hide out from the world. It just means that we do things differently than the world does. But it also means that we each individually have to be different, because we each have different people in different areas that we can really minister to people. The third thing is seek the Holy Spirit and expect the gifts. Seek the Holy Spirit. Seek God and coming to Him saying, I know it's all grace. I know I'm not earning this, but God, I want to be used and I want to, to go deeper. I want to experience it. You know, read some of these, these writers from the last couple hundred years giving their accounts of, of the experiences they had. And and we talk to people in this church and we give testimony to these incredible experiences and how I never thought I'd be doing this, but now God has me doing this. Those are great testimonies. And it doesn't come with a lackadaisical attitude towards spiritual things. We have to be seeking the Holy Spirit and expect the gifts. Expect, fully expect. We don't have to name which one. That's not our place. Seek the Holy Spirit and expect the gifts. Make a conscious decision to be in tune with heaven. In tune with heaven. That's through holy living. It's through right priorities. It's through biblical attitudes. Here's the fourth thing we can do. Embrace the uniqueness. Embrace the difference that God has designed in His prized creation, right? We're the ones at which He said on the sixth day and He saw that it was very good. We were designed perfect. Didn't take us long to wreck our record. But it wasn't God's fault. He created us very good. And it embraced the uniqueness that He's built into each of us. Uh, we look different. We're different sizes and shapes and colors, and we're, we're different sounds and different abilities and different skills, different passions. Embrace that uniqueness. And embrace the all of verse 6. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. Let's embrace that all. Let's dare to dream. Let's dare to expect God to do something magnificent in and through us. 
and let's determine ahead of time that he gets all the glory when that happens.